Hello, Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this iteration of ZK Study Club. I'm, this time, we're very excited to welcome uh, Srinath Sethi, who's actually presented on here before, but uh, he's presenting some new work, which um, has generated a bit of buzz in the ZK industry uh, around folding schemes, specifically Nova and Supernova. And so really excited to have him here to present this work. And apparently there's some even newer work on the same theme that we can look forward to here shortly. But uh, with that, Srinath, um, would you like to share a little bit about this work? and uh, what you're doing with Supernova and Nova. Thanks, thanks, Alex. So uh, it's great to be back here. Uh, I'm super excited to talk about this work. Uh, it's called Nova Supernova. Uh, this is joint work with Abiram Khatapali from CMU and Yana Tiala, who used to be at NYU and now she's at Google. Uh, so this talk is going to be about uh, these two papers that are linked. One of them appeared at Crypto last year and another one was posted on ePrint a few months ago. Uh, so, uh, so let me start with this simple question. So what is supernova? Supernova is a, a proof system. So there's a prover verifier, the prover sends a proof. Uh, so what's different is it targets um, what we call semi-structured computations. So uh, there is some computation that I, I'm going to get into more details on what this means, but uh, there's some input. Uh, the circuit itself can be decomposed into multiple pieces. And then finally a, a, an output comes out. So it uh, targets these kinds of computations. And uh, this might look strange, but uh, uh, it, uh, it this kind of pattern actually applies to many applications that uh, I think people care about, like um, uh, proving EVM executions or CPU executions like RISC-Y or WebAssembly, uh, or other things that you might not think about, like uh, ZKML, uh, ZK Bridge, PhotoProof, or even BDF. All of these fit into this pattern. I'll I'll talk about more uh, later in the slide how it fits. Uh, but there are a lot of applications that can be uh, made to work in this model. Uh, so, uh, another, uh, so uh, there are two uh, high-level takeaways uh, that I want to highlight here about supernova, which is that the supernova's prover, because it sort of targets this kind of computations, its prover is actually cheaper than using a general zk snark prover to prove such computations. Uh, the other aspect is that the supernova's prover's uh, per step cost is actually proportional to the size of the circuit uh, that's actually executed, execu the, the, the instruction that's actually executed. Let's say your virtual machine has like tens of instructions and at each step it only executes one instruction and the cost to the prover is actually proportional only to what's executed. It does not really depend on what else is supported. Like for example, if your instruction set as add, more, maybe kechak, when an ad is executed, it doesn't really pay for the cost of kechak. Uh, so we call this a la carte cost profile. I'll talk about uh, this more later. Another aspect uh, that I want to highlight in this slide is uh, uh, this uh, uh, supernova is built on what is called a folding scheme. So just to give an intuition on what a folding scheme is, suppose you have two circuits uh, that sort of have the same structure and they're executed on different inputs. Now this folding scheme is going to combine both of those, like instead of proving both circuit satisfiability instances, they're sort of combined into one uh, folded instance. And this folding is going to be inexpensive. So you can do this as many times as you want before you actually prove this uh, folded instance. That's where um, uh, all of these savings in the prover's cost is coming from. So I'll talk more about uh, all these different things uh, throughout the talk. Uh, and uh, and maybe I can just interrupt. I said I, you said you were okay with interrupting questions. So I'll be I'll pro provide the first interrupting question. Can you describe? I mean, maybe just for the context for both the audience, but also for the viewers of this. Uh, you know, when when it gets recorded, at this scheme, like I think some folks may have heard of incrementally verifiable computation (IVC). Like, how would you do you think this is a, a type of IVC or how do you compare this to IVC in general? Yes. As far as contextualizing. Yes, yes. I'll talk more about this later, but in a nutshell, this folding scheme will be a key ingredient to construct uh, IVC. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk more about this in, the, in a very few slides. <laughs> okay, great. I'll let you get to it. So, um, so the rest of this talk is sort of organized around these two questions. Like whenever the topic of NOVA or supernova comes up, one of the questions that people ask is like, where is supernova situated relative to other proof systems? And of course, uh, how the supernova itself works. So first I'm going to answer this. So I'm going to spend a few minutes to answer the first question. Uh, so to answer the first question, I sort of uh, 
uh, created a framework uh, that depicts all of the works that have appeared in the literature, going all the way back to um, uh, the first succinct argument that was implemented called Pepper. Um, so I've sort of organized this as an evolution of practical succinct arguments, and I've organized this in three stages. Uh, and in each of the stages, I've depicted works uh, in chronological order, like top to uh, top to bottom. And in each of these categories, I'm going to highlight one uh, major development that uh, sort of uh, led to uh, the works that are depicted at the bottom of the slide. So in the first category, which are all based on linear PCPs and what's now called linear-only encodings, uh, earlier works like Pepper and Ginger sort of required uh, the prover to spend quadratic time in the worst case. So this changed with the introduction of uh, QAPs, which provided a QAP-based linear PCP where the prover can be quasi-linear time, so which is almost linear time. Similarly, in the second category, all of the earlier works sort of uh, required the verifier to be non-succinct in the worst case, because the verifier had to read the description of the circuit itself. Uh, so this changed with the introduction of this technique called computation commitments, which is also sometimes called holography, where uh, the verifier only needs a succinct encoding of the circuit itself uh, to uh, verify. So this is how uh, succinct verification can be achieved in all of these works depicted below. Similarly, in the third category, all of the earlier works sort of uh, uh, to build a recursive snark. They uh, started with a snark. Uh, and then uh, uh, built a recursive snark out of it. Uh, so the later work sort of uh, 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 relaxed this requirement where instead of using a snark to recurse, you could uh, use a, uh, a snarkless recursion or use a folding scheme to construct a recursive snark. Uh, so now that I have sort of highlighted one major development in each of these categories, I'm going to uh, talk about how each of these categories uh, evolve over the earlier categories. So in the first category, uh, uh, we got the shortest proofs like with uh, construction like growth 16, uh, but it also has a per circuit trusted setup. Um, so the second category of work sort of got around this uh, uh, per circuit trusted setup with uh, so-called universal or even fully untrusted setup. It, uh, this setup just depends on the type of the polynomial commitments you used. And the second category of works can also support uh, this uh, notion of customizable circuits. So it can be used to drive down the cost of the prover. So in the third category, what, uh, uh, what it provides is it provides the fastest prover uh, uh, for certain kinds of computations like incremental circuits. I'll talk more about this later. And the other uh, advantage of this third category of uh, succinct arguments is the prover is much more easy to parallelize. Um, and it also gets all of the benefits of the second group. For example, it can have universal setup or untrusted setup, or it can also use customizable circuits. So one thing I'll note here is that some of the works that are depicted, they have not appeared in public, but they are in the process, like for example, on this work called Super Spartan and Super Marlin, they are going to be on ePrint very soon. They are already in the ePrint queue. The other work that is depicted here called a Hypono, which will be on ePrint. So I'll talk more about uh, what this uh, work provides. Are there any questions so far? Uh, no, I just a comment though. I think this is a great slide. This is a wonderful summary of kind of the work so far in this area. So thank you for just putting this together. Cool. Yeah, amazing slide. Thing. All right, so uh, now let's uh, get into the second question, which is uh, how does supernova actually work? So uh, one uh, one sentence summary of supernova is it's sort of uh, taking NOVA and then generalizing it to semi-structured computations or semi-structured circuits. So I'm going to first, uh, so to explain how supernova works, I'm going to sort of uh, go in stages where I'll start with NOVA and then eventually generalize it to supernova. Uh, so uh, at a very high level, our goal in uh, both NOVA and SuperNOVA is to sort of um, uh, construct fast ZK snarks for structured computations. Suppose we have a computation where we can decompose this into multiple steps. Uh, so there is a, a, a circuit C and it takes some non-deterministic input at each step, like I've depicted this with Ws. 
and then it uh, the circuit also takes uh, some input it produces an output which is fed into the next step of the computation so and so on and you keep repeating this computation to get the final output uh, zn um so this actually as i mentioned earlier this pattern applies and shows up in uh, many uh, practical scenarios for example in the case of a vdf uh, C would be one or more invocations of some delay function, uh, something like min root uh, that takes non-trivial sequential time to compute. So in the case of SDKVM, the C would be a step of a VM, for example, EVM or WASM or LLVM, or even a CPU like RISC-V. Uh, and in the case of the ZK bridge, C could validate state according to some rules of the blockchain. And in case of uh, what's called ZKML, C can apply a layer of the model. Uh, and in case of photo proof, C can apply a particular transformation to the photo, for example, blurring or resizing. And in the case of a public key directory, like the one that uh, WhatsApp announced recently, C could check if the directory, the public key directory maintained by the service is append only uh, in each epoch uh, that uh, uh, the directory service publishes its state. So there are a couple of things I'll mention, which is uh, in the later part, I'll generalize this to semi-structured computation, where in each step, we are not only applying one circuit, we can apply one of the possible circuits um, uh, from a predefined list. And uh, so I'm going to depict this computation in a sequential manner, but the proof generation does not have to be sequential. In particular, the prover could uh, execute the sequentially first and then produce the proof in parallel, for example, by using binary tree structure. Uh, but for the rest of this talk, I'm going to just ignore uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, the, the binary tree optimization and just focus on the sequential uh, proving. So one naive approach to prove this uh, kind of structured computation, we just unroll this computation, construct a giant circuit that invokes all of the uh, circuits with all the non-deterministic inputs, and it produces one output. And then we could take that circuit, apply a zk snark, any zk snarks, the pick the fastest and prove with it. Uh, one downside, obviously, is uh, the prover would have to get memory that's proportional to the number of times the circuit was invoked. Uh, it's in general harder to parallelize and distribute uh, monolithic zk snarks. Uh, the verified time might also depend on n, depending on the construction, and it obviously does not provide a faster prover than a general zk snark uh, because we are applying a zk snark to the circuit and it's not leveraging the uh, structure that's present within this unrolled circuit. Uh, so in 2008, there was an approach uh, provided called incrementally verifiable computation. So this comes back to the question that Alex was asking earlier, where instead of actually uh, proving this uh, computation in one shot, we are going to do this in multiple steps. And in each step, uh, uh, we're not going to prove uh, just the invocation of C, but we're going to prove an invocation of an augmented circuit. So in particular, there is the circuit C, and we're going to put uh, uh, a verifier inside the circuit. And uh, at each step, the proof- Yeah, I don't quite prove, so I was a bit lost. Okay. So, so sorry. So, sorry, Justin, were you, uh, you aiming for a question? You want to repeat anything? No, I'm so sorry about this. Please ignore what I said. I'm, I'll admit oh. myself. <laughs> All right, cool. No worries. I couldn't tell if you were asking a question or not. Uh, welcome, though. Yeah, go ahead. Keep rolling for now. All right. So, uh, so at each step, the verifier would uh, take a proof that was produced from the prior step, and it would verify this proof. And then it would pass, and uh, it, it applies an execution of C, and then pass an output to the next step. Uh, and in 2019, uh, 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 so so obviously, like maybe, maybe before I say uh, this 2019 work, like obviously the one downside of this approach is like you have to encode the snark verifier in entirety inside the circuit, which can have overheads. Uh, so in 2019, this work called Halo uh, provided a, a an improved approach where uh, you don't need to encode the full snark verifier. In particular, you can defer. Uh, a certain uh, expensive steps in the snark verification by using this notion of accumulation, where uh, in addition to this proof, there is this accumulator that I've depicted here with UIs. 
uh, u0 u1 and so on uh, so each step takes not only the proof from the prior step but it also takes this accumulator and this v prime what it's going to do is it uh, verifies part of the proof and then it updates the accumulator uh, and in the end we get a proof and this accumulator and an eventual verifier has to verify both of those and this actually uh, uh, led to major developments like for example uh, we could now use uh, snarks without trusted setup previously we had to rely on snarks with trusted setup because those were the ones which had a succinct verifier now this approach allows us to use uh, snarks without trusted setup that might not have even have a succinct verifier but there was think, sir not just quick to jump in here a question so this is i think this was pot I, I know you, you mentioned some of the early work but i think it was popularized is it correct to say this was popularized by halo like this concept of like the the halo um ivc system where you're recursively proving a single statement go ahead there i think you wanted to it, say something. It, it was invented by by us uh for the original version of halo yes cool i think the b actually i guess this is maybe an important point to to point out is, is the b is bow right there i believe these are all, all these uh, yes are bows. uh uh yeah um sean bow uh me and jack greg for the original paper yes yeah Cool. Well, uh, so awesome. It's great to have you here. So, uh, and, and contributing to the discussion, but yeah, I just wanted to clarify that oh. for, for some folks in the audience just who maybe are, are unfamiliar with the acronyms, but would maybe know these schemes as they're often referred to in industry. So it's not really a question. I just wanted to highlight that for uh, folks in the audience. Sorry. To yeah, no, I have also noted the name of the system. Uh, um, cool. So, uh, so this, this made a lot of progress. But I think there are still some downsides or uh, rather opportunities for improvement. Uh, so one downside for uh, doing this type of construction is uh, it sort of necessarily requires producing a snark for each invocation of the circuit. Uh, so we can't really hope for a faster prover uh, than the snark prover that was used. And the verifier circuit can still be substantially large, for example, like on the order of two to the 18 multiplication gates, uh, which can have large recursion overheads for certain applications. So what uh, NOAA uh, provides is it provides a new approach to realizing IVC. So it avoids snarks and even uh, non-succinct arguments of knowledge. So uh, one way to uh, summarize the key results of NOAA is uh, it, it, it shows that if you have uh, what is called a non-interactive folding scheme, you get an IVC. And we also show that there exists a public kind one round folding scheme for all of NP. And uh, because it's public kind, we can make it non-interactive in the RNM Oracle model and then heuristically in instantiate this um, non-interactive version in the plane model. So in the construction, what we achieve is the, the prover cost is now substantially cheaper than with a general snark. For example, it only requires two MSMs of size proportional to the circuit instead of like 22 or so uh, and other FFTs in case of Planck. Uh, uh, and the proof the, there's one downside to this construction, which is the proof sizes are linear in the size of the circuit. I'll show you later how we can use a general CK snark to compress those proofs. So, and if this compression is done infrequently, the cost of the prover can be kept, uh, uh, I guess, uh, minimal. So, uh, so the building block that we are going to use is called a folding scheme. Uh, so here is the high level description uh, where suppose the prover and the verifier have some circuit C and they have two uh, claims uh, that they, want to check, for example, uh, uh, some witness W1 and some public IO X1. And if the circuit is evaluated on these things, it's, it's going to output one. So that's one claim. And there's a similar claim for the second witness, W2 and X2. And our goal is to compress this into one claim about W and X. And uh, I, I'm going to describe what this folding scheme at a high level is and what these requirements are. Uh, so the prover takes this witness and public I.O. Uh, for both of the virginal instances as input, and it's supposed to output this um, new witness and new public I.O. And the verifier only takes the instance, which is the two public I.O.s, and it's supposed to output X. And one thing I'll just note here is like there are a lot of other inputs that the prover and the verifier are going to take, things like public key, proving key, and the verification key. I've sort of simplified that uh, for the sake of keeping it simple. Uh, so at a very high level, uh, there are some requirements this folding scheme should satisfy. Uh, suppose if the 
the virtual instances are satisfiable. We require that the output instance is also satisfiable. Uh, knowledge soundness says that the, the, if if for uh, this output instance, if the prover knows an output instance for uh, this folded instance, then it must actually know uh, the witnesses for the virtual instances. Uh, succinct uh, means the verifiers work uh, uh, is cheaper than uh, is concretely cheaper than uh, uh, checking one instance. Like the the cost of participating in this should be cheaper than checking the instance itself. Uh, finally, zero knowledge says uh, the interaction does not reveal anything about the input instances and the output instance. Anything beyond what uh, the the verifier already can see. So, uh, so before I actually describe Nova's folding scheme, I'll, I'll note that if you had a zk snark, you could trivially build a folding scheme. So here is how we can do it. Uh, so the prover has two instances to prove. So what it does is it proves one of them, one of the instances, uh, by sending a proof, and then the verifier verifies that snark and then sets this uh, folded instance to be the second instance. And then the prover sets the folded witness to the second witness. And you can show that uh, it actually satisfies all of the properties that, that I just said. Uh, but uh, our goal is to actually devise a folding scheme without using snarks or even non succinct arguments of knowledge. Uh, I can see that there's a question in the chat. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I was I was trying to avoid continually interrupting you the question, so I directed it at Dara, but. I'll say it for everybody. I was just trying to clarify here for just to dif distinguish between different types of systems. Would it be fair to say that a ZK snark folding scheme is Halo an example of a ZK snark folding scheme? Uh, uh, yeah. So, so retrospectively, yes. Um, at the time, it wasn't um, described exactly that way, but um, I. I I guess the, the terminology has changed a little bit uh, and been generalized mainly by uh, uh, BCMS20. Uh, so BCMS20 was the, um, the the terminology of accumulation schemes. And then I can't remember which paper introduced folding schemes. Maybe you know through enough. Oh, uh, the, through NOVA, enough. the NOVA paper. NOVA paper, OK. Yeah. Cool, yeah. And I, I don't mean to muddy the waters, but I do think it's helpful sometimes there's like, you know, similar sounding terms, folding and accumulation, sometimes it's worth pulling those apart for the audience and making sure we understand like where the differences are, where the similarities are to the extent they're distinguished. So anyway, uh, didn't mean to interrupt your flow, but thank you for clarifying. Dara and Serena. So, so our goal is to construct this kind of folding scheme without uh, using snarks or even a simpler version of snarks that may not be succinct uh, called narks. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, so, so the way NOVA constructs folding schemes is it starts with R1CS, which was uh, uh, implicit in the construction of GGPR 13. So here the circuit description is provided by these uh, three uh, matrices. Um, and the public input is X, a witness is satisfying if uh, uh, for Z, which is a concatenation of the witness, public IO and a constant one. Uh, this matrix relationship holds where AZ times BZ equals CZ, where the circle is the Hadamard product, the entry-wise product between vectors. Um, so one thing that I want to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, say here before I sort of continue with R1CS is there is some folklore or opinion in the community, which is uh, this R1CS era is over. This may or may not be true, but uh, one thing I want to say is uh, uh, even though I'm going to describe um, uh, NOVA for R1CS, uh, there are variants of NOVA like Sangria, which sometimes is also called Planck NOVA. It shows how NOVA can easily generalize to degree to Planckish. So there is this other work uh, uh, that's actually in, sitting in the ePrint queue uh, where we uh, introduce something we call customizable constraint system. Uh, one of the key aspects of the CCS is it simultaneously generalizes R1CS Planckish and Air, and it does so without actually paying any overheads. Uh, and another work that's upcoming is called Hypernova that uh, generalizes Nova to CCS, and then it also can capture Planckish. Uh, so for the rest of this talk, I'm sort of going to uh, live with R1CS and uh, leave the generalization to these later works. So. Any questions?
Uh, nope. I think there's no questions, so we can keep rolling. This is great. Thank you, Sri Nath. Thank you. Uh, so, so now let me uh, try to uh, motivate uh, the exact scheme that NOVA uses to hold r one instances. So let's uh, start with this r one instance where the prover has the two witnesses and the verifier has these ABC matrices that describe the circuit and, uh, and the also takes as input the public IO X1 and X2. And suppose we uh, just do a, a the usual trick that often shows up in uh, succinct arguments, which is the verifier sends a challenge to the prover. And now we just take a random linear combination of things. For example, we take X1 uh, uh, and then add with R times X2, and we do the same with the W, W01 uh, plus R times W2. And we set this to be the folded instance and witness respectively. And then the prover just outputs the witness and the verifier just outputs this uh, instance X. Unfortunately, this does not quite work. Uh, the reason is, uh, uh, as I'm going to show you now, so even if we just um, uh, uh, take this Z1 is R times Z2, uh, this L, uh, let's take this right hand side, which is CZ. Uh, so this expands to this um, AZ1 times uh, BZ1 plus R times AZ2 times BZ2. And then we take the LHS and then we expand it out. Uh, we get a bunch of cross terms and also a, a, some coefficients like R square, which don't show up on the LHS. So, uh, so what this means is like, uh, even if the virtual instances were satisfying, uh, for almost all values of R, the LHS is not going to be uh, equal to the RHS. So it's uh, uh, so it's not going to satisfy even completeness that we uh, want from the folding scheme. So the way we are going to fix this is uh, we introduce a small variant of R1CS that we call relaxed R1CS. And there are two differences here. One is uh, it multiplies the CZ with a coefficient uh, that I've denoted here by U. And then it also has this an extra term called E uh, that's added after CZ. And the, the goal of this extra error term is to capture all those cross terms that show up on the LHS. And the goal of this U is to capture this R square term that showed up. It showed up on one side, but it did not show up on the other side. So it, 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 this goal of U is to capture that R square term. So can I ask a question here? Um, so in general, if, if you allow E to be arbitrary, then this is always going to hold for some E, right? So um, so E has to be constrained in some way. I, I guess you're going to cover that now. Yes, yes, yes. So it's, yes, it is true that uh, for uh, if you don't constrain E, uh, it, it holds for any constraint system. But in our actual construction, uh, we're going to constrain that uh, the steps uh, that are uh, representing the computation will have E set to zero and U should be set to one. Uh, but we'll I'll talk about this uh, later. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this relaxed R1CS, one thing to note here is that it uh, sort of generalizes R1CS by, uh, for example, you can take any R1CS, set U to one and then E to zero, you get a relaxed R1CS. And the other direction also holds, but it's a little more uh, complicated. So you just have to combine this uh, CZ with E and you can recover an R1CS out of it. Uh, so, uh, so now we have this relaxed R1CS. So let's try to build a folding scheme for relaxed R1CS. Uh, so, uh, so as before, the prover takes two witnesses. The, now the verifier takes this error term as well as the scalar that I introduced. Uh, now we uh, have the prover send this cross term uh, that shows up uh, uh, along with the extra terms involving use. Uh, so the prover sends this. Now the verifier sends the challenge after receiving this message from the prover. Now the uh, the the verifier takes the weighted combination of use excess and then it uses uh, the cross term that was sent by the prover uh, to compute this new error term e uh, similarly the prover would uh, use the random challenge to fold the witness that was uh, uh, that it holds now the verifier and the prover output um, the folded witness and the folded instance yeah. uh, and it's it's important that e and u are part of the public input um, rather yes, than the witness yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 for now, yes. That's one of the issues that I will fix now. 
so there are actually like as uh, data pointed out, E is actually in the witness uh, in the instance rather than in the witness. This is actually not so good. Uh, uh, actually, let me uh, talk about that first. So the the problem with that is like this E is as big as the constraint system. Like in particular, it's as big as the number of constraints. Uh, so the verifier is not really succinct because it's taking the weighted combination of this uh, E vectors. Uh, so there is another problem that shows up while writing, uh, writing a security proof, which is the verifier can't really enforce that the prover is folding its witnesses correctly. Uh, it doesn't show it doesn't show up in completeness, but it shows up in the knowledge honest proof. Uh, Turns out we can address both of these problems simultaneously. Uh, in particular, the solution is to uh, use homomorphic commitments, uh, where uh, the instance contains uh, commitments to these error vectors and the witness vectors. And now we take this error vector that was part of the instance, we put it inside the witness. And I've depicted uh, these commitments with this overline uh, characters. Uh, uh, so the verifier now holds only homomorphic commitments to the error vectors and the witnesses. Uh, so now the, the protocol proceeds as before, except that uh, instead of sending the vector T, it would send a commitment to T. Uh, and the verifier sends challenge as before. And now the verifier, instead of folding the vectors, it's going to fold the two commitments that it holds. And it can do so because this commitment scheme, we are going to assume it's uh, going to provide this additive homomorphism, uh, something like Pedersen commitment. And the prover is now in charge of uh, do, uh, folding both uh, W as well as E using the uh, cross term and the virginal error vectors. Now the prover outputs uh, uh, the new witnesses and the verifier outputs the new instance. Um, and we can show that this satisfies both completeness as well as knowledge soundness. It's also sucks in because the verifier's work is uh, only folding these commitments. All right, so now uh, that we have this folding scheme, so we are going to use this to construct IBC. So the approach is actually very similar to how uh, Halo works, except we, uh, this verifier, instead of running a snark verifier, it's going to uh, run the folding schemes verifier. And instead of taking this um, accumulator, it's going to take an, a running instance. So it's going to take this U0, which is a running instance. Uh, and at each step, uh, uh, so uh, it's going to take uh, not a proof. Uh, it's going to take uh, a, a, an instance that represents the last step of the computation. So if you look at this uh, input to the second step, so there is Z1, which is the output of the first step. And there is U, little u1 which is an instance that represents the last step. And then there is the capital U1, which is uh, uh, the running instance. And what each step outputs is an updated running instance. So it takes the incoming instance, folds it into the running instance and outputs the updated instance. The, the U here is different from the U before that was added for the, the relaxed ones, yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I think uh, some overload. No problem. Yes, yes. Only 26 letters. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so the verifier, as I said, it's the verifier in the non interactive So we, obviously, like we can't use the interactive folding schemes verifier. So we have to make it non-interactive before we can recurse. So the V here is the verifier in the non-interactive folding scheme. And uh, because it's only doing this folding, we can have the lowest recursion over it. For example, the verifier circuit size is only like 10,000 R1 CS gates. Uh, and this UI is a commitment to the witness of the previous step. Uh, and this capital UI is a commitment to the running witness and the running error term. Uh, and the recursive proof turns out as a combination of these two things. So it's the uh, the, the last steps commitment along with the running uh, commitment plus the corresponding witnesses. So that's the recursive proof, which is linear in the size of the step. Uh, so. Uh, so the so there are two uh, so there are uh, two components. One is the last steps instance witness, and then there is the running instance and witness. Uh, obviously, this is linear in size. So what uh, Nova does is it folds two into one by just applying one more invocation of the folding scheme. So we get just get one instance and one witness. But obviously, this is uh, uh, going to give some reduction, like a factor two. But the proof sizes are still linear in the size of the step. Uh, so uh, naively, what we could do is we could use a general ZK snark to prove the knowledge of the satisfying U and W. 
and this can be used to get additional succinctness and zero knowledge but it can be expensive because it's uh, this zero knowledge not is going to prove uh, some statements about commitments which may or may not have uh, native representations uh, so what NOAA does is uh, it's going to look at this proof and uh, uh, then what it does is it treats these commitments like commitments to vectors as commitments to multilinear polynomials. Uh, so once we do this uh, uh, treatment, what we can do is you can use a, 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 a snark based on multilinear polynomials. So in particular, NOVA uses Spartan uh, to prove that this uh, R1CS relationship holds on those committed polynomials. And what this provides is the proof size uh, uh, goes from linear number of field elements to a logarithmic number of group elements. This is an exponential improvement in proof size. Of course, uh, one may use other proof systems like Planck or Marlin, as long as you can uh, uh, sort of treat these commitments to vectors as commitments to some polynomials, and then you can use those uh, uh, proof system directly. Uh, uh, and in particular, using these proof systems might reduce the proof sizes further. Like for example, you might get a constant number of group elements, uh, but the prover time may be more than what we had in the uh, So uh, Srinath, quick question here. So do we even need to go to sort of a PIOP style model here? Because I mean, for example, um, would it not be possible to use like a modification of the bulletproofs um, arithmetic circuit proof system directly in the sense that we really are just proving sort of uh, matrix vector multiplications, right? And then a hard amount product. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, that's a good question. I think um, uh, for the case where we only have, for example, there are no pairings uh, and we just are yeah. using proof cycles, um, I think you will get um, uh, similar um, uh, asymptotics like the log proof size linear verification time just by using bullet proofs. Uh, but there is uh, other settings. I think this uh, going through this polynomial IOP still has some advantages. For example, let's say at least one of the curves has pairings. Like I think there are many constructions, like for example, there are some constructions data has created. And there are also, I guess, BN254 gram. There are other constructions of these curve cycles where at least one of them has the uh, pairing, then you, you yeah, the that. half pairing cycles, yes. Yeah, yes, you can use that to get uh, even better verification times. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was talking about the sort of um, uh, the no pairing, pairing free cycle uh, setting. So in that setting, I think you could get better performance than Spartan because anyway, you're paying like a linear verification time, so you don't actually care about holography. So you wouldn't need to do like the matrix um, arithmetization stuff. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. But I think keeping this polynomial IOP route sort of opens up to other commitment schemes. For example, I think um, uh, 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 half pairing cycles. And even I think if you're okay with some non-native arithmetic, you could do something like Dory uh, and get a lot of verification. Sure. Good, good question, thanks. Uh, so, uh, so now that I've talked about this, uh, how NOVA works and how it compresses these proofs, so now let's look at how to prove machine executions, things like EVM or RISC-V or CPUs or more like uh, uh, what I call semi-structured computations. Uh, so one approach would be uh, we could take the C and we encode a step of the VM and uh, this uh, C should be able to execute any of the supported instructions. Uh, for example, it can execute add, mull, or kechak, load, store, EC add, EC mull, like all the uh, opcodes that are supported by this machine. Uh, so one downside at this, at this point is like the size of the circuit is at least proportional to the sum of the sizes of these individual instructions. So for example, you might need a circuit for kechak, you need a separate circuit for mull, and it, the C is going to be at least of that size. Uh, so as a result, the prover's cost, even if you use NOVA, which has the lowest prover cost, it's going to be proportional to this, uh, at least of C crypto operations at each step. Uh, so what this does is it forces the circuit C to be as minimal as possible. Like we can't really go for a, a, a widely used virtual machine like EVM. We have to design a small VM that's maybe minimal instructions. Uh, so it's not really a solution because if you want to execute a real world program, you'll have to execute tons of iterations of this minimal C. 
so what uh, what we introduce in this uh, in the work supernova is that uh, uh, we define something we call non-uniform IVC, where we have a collection of uh, uh, functions, non-deterministic functions, which we denote with C1 through CL, and think of them as circuits encoding uh, different instructions. And we also have this special uh, function called phi, uh, which is going to help us pick one of the instructions to execute. So there is an initial input as before, Z0. And the goal is to prove that Zn is the output. After applying these uh, uh, different circuits, like at each step, we are going to use phi to uh, pick the circuit we want to execute. For example, at step zero, we compute phi on W0, Z0. We get an index. So phi is mapping from these witnesses and inputs to some index uh, between one and L. So we're going to apply that circuit get an output, feed it to the next step. So at each step, uh, uh, there is a selection of uh, which circuit to execute. And uh, also this is the model, uh, sorry, this is the, uh, the non-uniform IVC model. And uh, uh, we can think of NOVA as providing this NIVC, but only for a single instruction. So before I so, sort of talk about how supernova works, I'm going to, or uh, uh, get deeper into how NOVA applies to the single instruction model. Uh, so I, 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 in, the, in the previous slides, I mentioned there is an augmented circuit. There is some C concatenated with the verifier circuit. So I've sort of just elaborated what's going on inside that circuit. So it takes two things, the little UI, capital UI, and it feeds it into this non-interactive folding schemes verifier, which outputs a new running instance, UI plus one. So what this little UI is really a claim about the prior step. And this capital UI is a claim about all the prior steps. And then this UI plus one is a claim about all of the prior steps plus uh, uh, the little UI combined. Uh, so this is exactly what happens uh, at a particular step in NOVA. And we can think of this as NIVC uh, applied to one single instruction. There's only one C. So now what supernova does, this might look a little complicated, so I'm going to walk through. Uh, so what supernova does is it, it does exactly what NOVA did, except it's going to change the verifier circuit. So in particular, uh, uh, instead of a single C, we are going to index that with some uh, 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 what we call program counter. And at each step, the C uh, PCI plus one is going to be different. It's going to be, diff uh, it's going to be picked from this phi. So we have this, some computation that's executed. Think of that as the computation associated with the instruction. Then there's phi inside the circuit. And then there is, as before, uh, this non-interactive folding scheme. Um, so what this um, non-interactive folding scheme does is it uh, takes a collection of running instances. So there are now more than one capital UIs. It applies a multiplexer. So it picks just one of them. It so happens to pick uh, uh, just the, uh, the PCI provided from the last step. So it picks one of the running instances, it picks the claim from the previous step, and it folds it into that picked running instance. And then it updates only one of those running instances. So, so at this stage, the, the instances have to be chosen in advance of the, the set of possible um, uh, instructions in this case has to be chosen in advance because your 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 claims as uh, the size of them is proportional to the um the number of instructions yeah yeah that's a good question so i think um uh, in the simplest version uh, i think we can think of it as being chosen like for example the instruction set is fixed uh, we have a well defined i guess maybe some canonical ordering of these running instances and you're going to update it based on that uh, but in practice what's going to happen is um uh, so we are not going to have the circuit read all of the running instances because that's going to be expensive. It's going to, mm -hmm. like if you have 100 instructions, this now the circuit has to read 100 instances, but it's going to update only one of them. So that's not very useful. So what we are going to do is one of the optimizations that we describe in the paper is it's, it's, it's somewhat standard where instead of taking all the instances, we are going to put them in a, a verifiable memory. Think of it as a Merkle tree, but there are other structures like multi-sets. Uh, and at each step, we are going to read only one of them and then write back uh, 
uh, whatever was updated. So in this model, it turns out you can sort of uh, uh, support, uh, 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 I guess, uh, instructions that may not have been fixed. For example, you encounter a new yeah. instruction, you can put it in some new location in the Merkle tree, for example. Uh, so it, it sort of follows you to uh, add new instructions. Yeah, so, so, so all you need to do basically is have some rules for how the Merkle tree can be updated. Yeah, yeah. So, so that could support things like smart contracts, um, for instance, uh, adding a new contract. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so this is exactly what I was going to say. We don't have to really read all the instances. We just read what's necessary and update it um, uh, by applying this folding scheme. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so before I sort of summarize this talk, I'll uh, uh, I'll just note that there is actually a way to build this kind of VMs without using recursive zk snark. In particular, one of the early works called VRAM, what it does is it takes a non-recursive zk snark, and in the uh, case of a non-recursive zk snark, it turns out you can sort of trim these universal circuits, so, so you don't really have to execute all the instructions. Uh, that the machine supports at each step. So I uh, I sort of depicted these three columns where there is recursive zk snark like Nova or Halo 2, uh, and you run with universal circuit. Then there is uh, zk snarks with trim circuits, uh, uh, and then there is supernova. And I've sort of picked these four uh, characteristics to compare these three categories of works. Uh, Sorry, uh, what what do you mean by a trimmed circuit here? Yeah, like for example, I think uh, uh, here let's say we have uh, uh, some virtual machine that has some instructions. Turns out uh, when you execute, it only invokes some of them. Uh, and instead of using a universal circuit, uh, you can just sort of pick the circuit that was actually executed and you can build a, a circuit only of the executed instructions. Think of it as just execution. And it, it uh, works if you're not using the recursive snarks anyway. Uh, so, uh, so the recursive snarks with universal circuit obviously don't uh, satisfy this cost profile, the a la carte cost profile, which means uh, pay only for what you execute. Uh, whereas this uh, ZK snarks with trim circuits can satisfy that because they only pay for what uh, what's executed. Supernova turns out even though it's using a Z recursive ZK snark, sorry, I think uh, my animation is a little messed up. Uh, let me go through this. <laughs> Uh, so, so supernova, even though it's using a recursive snark, it can get this alacarte cost profile. Uh, and incremental proof generation, obviously the recursive snarks can provide it, non-recursive snark does not. Zero knowledge, turns out it's a little tricky in this uh, case of VRAM because it reveals the number of instructions of each type that's executed. Whereas with recursive snarks and also supernova, it's easy to get zero knowledge. Uh, finally, one uh, 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 maybe disadvantage of recursive ZK snarks is there is some recursion overhead. Uh, and there are also some primitives that may not be as efficient. For example, one prime example might be memory. For example, if you have to use memory, we have to either use a Merkle tree or uh, a multi-set based hash function. Uh, both of this uh, results in like at least few hundred constraints uh, per memory operation. Whereas in the non-recursive snark context, uh, you can use permutation networks or other fingerprinting approaches that has much lower cost to uh, access memory. Uh, but one thing that I'll just note here is that uh, this uh, sort of recursive overhead can be mitigated if uh, each instruction is doing at least some work. Uh, one ballpark number that I'll throw here is uh, uh, if each instruction is doing at least 10,000 gates of work, then uh, this recursion overhead, uh, I think, is not an issue. Are there so so in, in the case of simulating memory, um... So, so you can do cheap memory operations within one of these um, instructions. Um, but then, so suppose you have a fully random access memory and you, you don't know what part of the memory um, each instruction is accessing. Would you still have to pay the overhead of the, um, the Merkle tree uh, operations between steps? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So what, what we can do is um, we can still get the a la carte cost profile. What I mean by this is let's say at a particular step, I want to access memory. I could have an instruction that's doing this memory load uh, and it's going to pay for that memory Merkle tree or multi-set based whatever memory that we use. 
only for that memory access. Let's say the next step is not accessing the memory. It's not going to pay for that cost. We can sort of uh, move all of this work into a separate instruction that's executed only when needed. Well, uh, I, I guess an, I guess another thing you can do is that you, you can kind of have a cache memory that's used within each step and then it's only the, the higher level cache that gets um, uh, updated between steps. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Srinath, uh, so in the separate memory instruction uh, case, um, this doesn't quite work if you have, say, like a one Neumann architecture, right, where you have to do a memory load to fetch the instruction you're actually executing at that time step, right? Um, mm -hmm. If you have a sort of Harvard style architecture, then sort of you've hard coded the program so you know exactly which instruction you're going to execute next, but this is not quite the case for um, von Neumann cell architectures, right? Yeah, 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 that, that's a good point. Yes, yes, I think if you're going to anywhere read uh, an instruction from memory and that might be self-modifying, yes, yes, I think you do need to load at each step. Uh, I, I agree. Don't do that because you, you won't be able to audit or um, prove anything about that kind of program anyway. I mean, even if you don't have self-modifying, like uh, yeah. the, the, the program section of memory is not uh, touchable or whatever, right? There's uh, read only. Even then, you still have to do the read to read from memory, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I think the best might be for the read only memory case. I think the best might be to use the multi-set hash function because uh, anyway, you're going to read all of the program at least. Uh, at each step, you just use this multi-set hash-based memory where I think you pay only like a few hundred constraints. Yeah, I mean, maybe the program size was small enough that you can uh, fit it like within these 10,000 gates cheaply. Yes. yes. Um, also, another question. So I guess uh, you can generalize this supernova idea to work um, with other recursive snark constructions too, right? Essentially, like you have a hash of all of the verification keys that you would want to, uh, you know, for, for each instruction, for example, right? And then you you pick out from your uh, your Merkle tree uh, which ver which VK you would like to verify at this time step, and then um, uh, yeah, you verify proof with respect to that VK only, right? So it, it is. Um, they, I guess you can describe it at a le level of abstraction, maybe above folding schemes. Yeah, yeah, actually, that's a good point. I think, um, yeah, you could sort of treat this recursive snark or even a snark itself as a black box. And then all of this uh, selection of uh, instructions and what verification key is being used, uh, folded, uh, running instance, all these things are picked at a layer above. I think you're totally right. One, uh, I guess, downside of doing that might be the concrete overhead, because now sure. you might be doing all this folding at the layer above as well as the layer below by sort of doing both uh, together you get some concrete improvements maybe at least a factor two yeah good point um conceptually it may be easier to think about them as two separate things mm -hmm. all right so, so in summary supernova is a new proof system with a fast prover and it also provides small proofs it provides this a la carte cost profile where you pay only for what's executed. It introduces new techniques such as folding schemes. It also leverages uh, best in class techniques like the linear time subjects through Spartan. Nova is fully implemented, it's available, it's being used by several projects. And uh, Supernova offers uh, a new substrate uh, for building proof based trustless services. And it, I think it has many advantages over the alternatives. Uh, finally, there is some upcoming work uh, that allows proving customizable constraint systems uh, uh, in the style of NOVA. Uh, with that, uh, I will conclude and happy to take more questions. So. Uh, and it's MIT licensed that implementation. Yes. It, it uses uh, uh, pasta curves. Uh, uh, so. oh, cool. I, I didn't realize it was doing that. Thanks. Um, awesome. I don't think your co-authors ended up joining Sranath. At least I did not see them. Um, so I guess we can skip introducing them, but obviously thank you for presenting and thank you to all three of you for this work. Uh, do we have any questions from the group? Feel free to chime in or just write it in the chat and I'll read it. 
I am quite curious about this new uh, constraint system, which generalizes R1CS and, and Planckish. Is there a, a, an easy way to describe it in, in a small amount of time, I guess? Yeah, so I think, uh, like for example, if you look at R1CS, it takes this AZ time, Hadamard with BZ equals CZ. Uh, so what this, uh, you can sort of think of it as uh, hard coded with three matrices ABC. Uh, and it's picking two of them in the Hardamart product and then one of them uh, to be the linear term. So what the CCS does is it allows you to uh, uh, basically sort of specify how many matrices you have and how each of those matrices are picked in different terms. So uh, uh, you immediately get R1CS as a special case because you just have three matrices, you pick them in the uh, special order. Uh, uh, and then the generalization to Planckish is uh, uh, so Planckish applies a multivariate polynomial for each row of the constraint. So you can emulate the same thing by picking these matrices in a certain way, and also the uh, the multi sets that sort of describe which matrices are picked in each term. So you can think of um, uh, uh, the R1 CS being a, a special degree two equation. Whereas the CCS being a, a multivariate polynomial constraint. Uh, but we don't need to go into the level of polynomials. We can still work just like in R1CS, uh, where everything is described in terms of matrix operations and Hadamard products. So uh, uh, it turns out one of the uh, 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 outcomes of uh, sort of defining it this way was if you had a, a, a snark for R1CS, for example, Marlin or Spartan that were designed for R1CS they almost very easily generalized to handle CCS. Uh, and then uh, by the extension, they can also handle Planckish. Uh, so this uh, sort of uh, decoupling the, the constraint system from the proof system itself sort of, uh, I think, uh, made it easier to show these techniques apply to different proof systems uh, very easily. Yeah, the, the, there's currently an effort to standardize um, Planckish as an arithmetization. Uh, and I'm just thinking it might be um, a good idea to make sure that we we have a mapping of that to um, CCS. Is it? Did you say? Um, yeah. Yeah, it seems feasible. Yes. Yes. So in the paper that's currently sitting on the ePrint queue, we have uh, we have a definition of CCS and also reductions. Happy to hear comments uh, from folks working in this space. So. I think it's be online soon. Yeah, that sounds cool. Is a rough idea that sort of you generalize the Hadamard product to be like a multi-product instead of just a, um, you know, ZA times ZB equals ZC? Yes, yes, exactly. So we, we in addition to this uh, allowing any number of matrices, we also ask you to specify some multi-sets. These multi-sets are supposed to describe how different matrices are sort of uh, combined with the Hadamard product. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I think uh, the 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 snark design sort of comes out of the out of this definition very easily because yeah. in all of these snarks you sort of prove this uh, what is called the row check and it automatically generalizes to this more general form. Yeah, exactly. So the link so, check uh, as before. So so the so this generalized R one CS um it, it has the same properties R one CS where you can have um linear combinations that um. So a, a, a very cheap, um, even if it's a large number of terms. Um, yes, yes, exactly. I think okay. um, uh, it, um, it 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 has the exact same uh, cost model, I guess, uh, or the behavior as R1C. So at each step, you sort of are multiplying not just the variables, you're multiplying these linear combinations. So. Yeah, but I think uh, for Malin and, and Spartan also, like the linear combinations are not exactly free in that you pay for like the density of the constraint matrices right in the proving step whereas if you look at growth 16 yes. the proof like the prover operation the cryptographic operation scale only with the number of constraints right yeah yeah actually that's a good point i think uh, 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 in the polynomial iop i guess in my picture the slide that had the three categories i think the first turns out also the last category can have costs that don't depend on the number of non zero entries in these matrices for the msms uh, yeah yeah, like even the uh, the the recursive stuff, they can don't have to pay for the uh, the non-zero entries. 
mm-hmm. for the the ones at uh, the time of compression obviously you have to pay and in the second category the non recursive snarks you do pay for this the universal ones they pay for the non zero entries so yeah yeah I, I mean even in plonk in some sense you're actually paying for that like addition gates are not free in the same way yeah yeah we we found that in practice um the additions are not that much of a constraint because the the things that you could do using the um sort of almost free additions in r1cs um you can do with running some gates and um things like that that um that you you can kind of do them in parallel with other operations that you were doing anyway um but mm-hmm. yeah if, if if there's a model that um so it, it, even if you do have to pay for non-zero uh, entries in the matrix, um, which I, I think you have to do in all universal um, mm-hmm. proof systems, then the simplicity of R1CS as a um, as an arithmetization, so the the fact, for example, that you have completely independent constraints, you don't have the complexities of um, layouts that you have in um, uh, Plonk with um, custom gates, then um, and then combining that with the the ability to have polyno- polynomials of higher degree, um, the, that is quite attractive. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of one of the at least one of the things we hope with this CCS is I think you can maybe mix Plonkish with R1 CS because it's it's defined in a unified manner. I think it may allow such mixing when appropriate. Uh... And Srinath, I think you mentioned that uh, CCS also generalizes R, and I guess these are the three like main competing arithmetizations: uh, R1 CS, Plonkish, and R. I guess my question is, is there some like commonly used arithmetization which CCS does not capture naturally? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I think, um, yeah, so far, yeah, I guess um, it seems like it can capture all these three, but it, it's not clear, I guess, if there is something else that it does not capture. It, it would capture in the sense it's general enough you can transform, but the question is, is there overhead to doing it? Um, uh, so for these three, we show it, there's no overhead really to uh, do it. For something else, I think you should always be able to transform, except there may be overhead depending on how it's specified. I have a question about, or do you want to continue that line? Okay, no, uh, carry on. Okay, I have a question about the, how you see the. Well, I'll turn my camera on, I guess. Um, how you see the horizon with respect to air stuff? I think for the most part, systems that use air are also using fry, but this folding approach depends on the additive homomorphic encryption scheme or commitment scheme. You mentioned Pedersen commitments as an option, but I was curious what you see as sort of the the horizon in systems that are using air fry arguments and looking at folding. Is that something you've thought about much? Yeah, I think uh, that's, a, that's a question, but I, I, don't, I don't have anything concrete to add, except that um, I think uh, uh, in those schemes that don't rely on this elliptic curves, I guess you can gain from using the smaller fields. Uh, and so on and so forth. I think that's how a lot of the schemes sort of get uh, better poor performance there. Uh, but obviously, as you said, there is no homomorphism to exploit do folding schemes there. So I, yeah, I think I don't know what uh, what might happen now. Well, well we, we haven't mentioned lattice space schemes. So um, I think that you, you could get um, both the homomorphic commitments and um, uh, post quantum security potentially. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I think, I think, yeah, people have mentioned this lattice commitments, but I think there hasn't been, I guess, uh, a concrete proposal, or at least I haven't seen a, an implementation or something that shows it's possible. So, yeah, you have to figure out how to deal with the errors that arise from that is based stuff. And also, I guess, in some sense, you need like a cycle of lattices, whatever that might mean. Um, 
for this to actually work out. Um, yeah, although, yeah, actually, I don't know if the cycle is crucial because you might be able to do non-native stuff because if it's small enough, it might not be expensive. Yeah, so, yeah, if you, if you can do lookups um, uh, and it, if you have um, sort of uh, uh, polynomial constraints of, of some sort of small degree greater than two, say, say four or five, then you can definitely do lookups. Um, so if you can do that, then the um, the non-native arithmetic isn't necessarily that expensive. Um, it's it's still more expensive than cycles or curves. Yeah. Serena, you mentioned that CCS generalizes uh, Plonkish with with no overhead. Like, what what is the definition of of overhead in that in that context? Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. I think. Um, uh, there are, I guess, two ways to look at it. One is um, if you go take the constraint system, transform into CCS, like what's the size of the witness? What's the size of the number of constraints that you have to use? And I think one way, one uh, rough way to capture this might be what's the time, running time of the NP checker in the old representation and in this new representation. Turns out the witness size does not grow. The public IO size does not grow. The number of constraints does not grow. The NP checker time does not grow. That's how we said uh, uh, the the two does not have overheads. But I think there is one more layer. We could look at a snark for Plonkish and a snark for CCS after the transformation, and we see what's the prover time. I think we haven't really done the second one yet, uh, but I think that might also be more useful in practice. Uh, but we have done the first one where we look at the witness sizes and uh, the NP checker time. NP checker is just looking at the witness and the constraint system and checking if it's satisfiable. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Final call for questions for Srinath. Okay. Great, I think we can end it here. Thank you everyone for attending and thank you very much Srinath for uh, presenting today. This is uh, really good and there's some really great slides in here too. By the way, if you have these, if you're willing to share these slides, we'd love to uh, link them to the uh, to the video link or in the video description where we post the video, if that's okay. Of course, I'm happy to send them. Uh, thanks, thank you so much for all the questions and uh, inviting me here. All right, thanks everyone thank very you. much. Thanks.